I think it would be helpful as a point of financial education to describe the protections that your agency provides to people's savings slash investments. And then number two, to talk about uh, some of the solutions to this challenge that FDIC is looking at. Well, thank you, Mark, and good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the FDIC, uh, as Mark mentioned, is uh, called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and our primary mission is to ensure the safety and soundness of uh, America's banking system. Clearly, we have our hands full these days. <laughs> but let me tell you a couple of ways that we go about doing that and some of the things that we are, are doing with regard in, to this foreclosure crisis. Typically, one of the first things FDIC does is ensure your deposits so that you have um, every confidence that the money that you put into an FDIC-insured financial institution is protected, even in situations like this, even when the bank fails and goes out of business. That protection, however, is somewhat limited, but I think it covers your average Americans. Uh, the protection is, at, at a minimum, up to $100,000 per person per account. There are ways that you can increase that insurance um, coverage if you have more than 100000 in any one given account in the bank. But I, uh, I would suggest that you talk with, either go to FDIC's website at www.fdic.gov and click on Consumer and it will walk you through. We have um, a program there called EDI that will, where there's actual sort of lady named Edie who will walk you through that process and help you understand. And if you're not web connected, where might you go? Then you can call um, the FDIC directly at 1-800-ASK-FDIC. And they can walk you through um, the, the, uh, the various provisions of, uh, or variations on deposit insurance. In addition, you can speak with your financial institution. They'll be glad to walk you through it. So that's one of the things that we do. That's first and foremost. Ensure your deposits. Um, the second thing that we do is to examine financial okay. institutions um, that are chartered uh, through the FDIC or regulated by the FDIC via their charters to help ensure that they are operating in a safe and sound manner and don't get into the kinds of problems that we are seeing today. Uh, Congressman Waters already alluded to the fact that there's a lot of blame to go around for uh, the situation that we're in today, and quite frankly, some of it is with the, the, the regulators. Um, I won't go into the, the role the regulators have or have not played there, but clearly our role is to regulate these institutions to keep them from getting in this kind of situation. Um, and then the fourth thing, that, the third thing that we do is provide financial education and outreach assistance to help uh, banks do more lending and investing and provide services in the communities that they serve. We do that through partnering them with, um, with good organizations on the ground, nonprofits, other organizations that can bring resources to the table to help financial institutions make investments in their communities in a way that gets to the people who need the money in the way that they need the money, and at the same time allows those institutions to do it in a safe and sound manner. Here's an example where we, we quite frankly, haven't done a good job in that arena. So we are doing some things to try and help uh, with that issue now that we have it. First, I'd like to, if I could, I'd like to share two quick things with you that FDIC uh, is doing. One, our chairman, Sheila Baer, has issued guidelines as of the end of August um, to f financial institutions suggesting a consistent approach to workouts with their borrowers. Um, about a year ago, she had made some recommendations more broadly to the industry and suggested that, or that financial institutions um, continue, those who had mortgages with these teaser rates that were going to reset and make pe put people in a position where they could not afford to pay their mortgages, the chairman suggested that they just not reset the rates. Just if, the, if uh, borrowers were paying on time and had a good track record up to the point that the loan was about to reset, just continue it at the current rate. Well, the end, it was suggestion. And so some lenders took the suggestion, others did not. And so now, fast forward a year later, where we're beginning to see financial institutions fail under the burden of, these, of this bad debt, and FDIC actually has to go in and begin to take over these institutions and operate them as a federally controlled bank. It gives FDIC an opportunity to put our money where our mouth is. It gives us an opportunity to work directly with borrowers who are at risk of foreclosure 
to do workouts on a consistent format. And so what we're doing with the first one that we've gone into is to identify the borrowers who are at risk, send them letters inviting them to come in and rework their mortgages, and to rework those mortgages in a way that allows that borrower to get within 38% of their gross monthly income that's being devoted to their mortgage payment. Many of these loans that are going into default now are way above 38%. People are paying much more than 38% of their income to pay their mortgage. They're into 40, 45, 50% of their income. <coughs> so what we're doing is lowering the interest rates, adjusting the payment so that they get down within 38% and have, uh, they can afford the mortgages. If that doesn't work, if they're too upside down and that doesn't work, then the next step is to extend the term to move those mortgages from 25, 30 years out to 40 years. And uh, if that doesn't work, then we're looking at forgiving a portion of the principal, setting that aside, having it be a non-interest bearing portion of the principal to get the principal amount down to the level that an interest rate reduction and an extension of term can help. Second thing that we're doing is reaching out to communities who are hearing, who are getting the calls from borrowers who are in trouble. You've probably heard the statistics that somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% of people who are at risk of foreclosure have not contacted their lender. They didn't think that anything could be done. They didn't think, they thought the lender was after their home. Well, they're scared and, to contact the lender. Yeah, you know, exactly. Right? Lender. Exactly, but they you are think he's going He's not never going to exactly. have good news for you. He's going to always say, where's my yeah. money? Right, <laughs> exactly. But they are contacting their pastor. They are contacting counseling agencies. They are contacting organizations like Operation Hope and the NeighborWorks Network. And so we've been working with NeighborWorks, moving to those areas, those states that have the highest concentrations of foreclosures, and working with what we've been calling first responders, the people who do get that first call who know very little about the foreclosure Yeah, and process. I want to offer this thought. I mean, I think we need to have a conversation with Mr. Wade about how to get this information out to the community how to let people know what options are available. This business is complex. Most people with caller ID, if they see the bank calling, pretend that the phone didn't ring, right? Right. And we have to bridge that, and that's what counseling sure. is all about. That's what financial education is all about. But I think if people have a sense that they have a right and an option, to a renegotiation, mm -hmm. to a workout, they're going to be much more capable exactly. and much more available to have uh, the conversation. If they know that counseling, which is free, <coughs> is available to them to interface with the financial services institution, then they'd be much more likely to do this. So these are some ideas, folks, about some things that uh, are on the drawing boards. Let's give Mr. Bowman a, a round of applause and thank you for his comment. I want to do two things here. Uh, we want to get you involved for questions, but before I do that, the first panel, we're going to have to excuse them shortly, but I want to do this. There's a big discussion going on in Congress today. The president has asked both candidates for president to meet him in the White House. There are discussions going on on Capitol Hill and on Wall Street. Uh, the initial idea was uh, to obligate the taxpayers up to $700 billion to purchase bad debt, bad loans from financial services companies to, in effect, let them clean their balance sheets so that they could get back in the business of lending again. Very quickly, I want to ask Mr. Raines, Mr. Wade, Mr. Parks, Mr. E, uh, if you can, uh, if you were going to offer one idea on how that plan could significantly be improved, or secondly, an alternative approach, very quickly, Mr. Raines, what would it be? I would not be trying to buy exotic mortgages from financial institutions because I think they know a lot more about what they own than the government does, and I think the government is going to end up overpaying. I think what needs to be done is to help the financial institutions finance these obligations until they can be worked out. And 
that's a very different thing than owning them. The risk of loss should stay with the financial institutions. It should not move to the government. So you suggest a different approach altogether. I'm a different approach, but it's an approach that, that time and time again we've seen is the only thing that works. Real solutions are needed to the underlying asset, not making Wall Street feel better. I mean, we've tried that for the last few weeks. Every Monday we wake up and there's another thing we've done to make Wall Street feel better. Wall Street will feel better when there's a real solution, and so will homeowners feel better when there's a real solution. I would simply fund the mortgages long enough to work them out in order that pe real people are in these homes and not move that risk to the, to the government. I'd leave the risk with the financial institutions, but I'd provide them the cash necessary to finance those bad assets until they can be worked out, together with that grant program I talked about to help the workout succeed. The conductor on the train asked me if the arsonist was now going to be the fire chief. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wade. Sure. I, I, I would say it's really all about the homeowner. That precipitated the crisis. We have to do everything we can to keep more people in homes, regardless of where the assets end up, end up, whether they stay on the balance sheet of the financial institutions, whether they end up on the balance sheet of the federal government. If we don't keep more people in homes, it's going to continue to downward spiral in housing prices. It's going to continue to feed the recession, and there will be no end in sight. So I think it's really all about keeping people in homes. Thank you. Mr. Parks? Uh, I, I did two things. One, I would look at whether you wanted to put an equity infusion into the companies and take warrants and reps in the companies rather than take on the assets themselves. Because I agree with Frank, you don't know what's in the assets pool. And the second thing I would do is, I think is the most important thing, is insist upon transparency in whatever is done. My greatest concern about this legislation is, are we going to pick the same asset managers? Are we, going to pick this, are we going to be able to bundle and send the loans back to the same companies? And there's got to be a clear conflict of interest uh, provisions in place, and you've got to make sure that the assets are actually dispersed to people who weren't involved in this, in this toxic environment, and you create new actors involved. Like was so you say an equity infusion, what, through the... Through the government what, could actually do some equity to, to, to it either words, take, the government buy capital on the stake in the financial services companies? Right, and then get the warrants and reps and get the return back as a backflow. Because it sounds like, with, like Frank was saying, you want to leave the risk on the balance sheet of the banks as opposed to put it on the government. Because my fear is if you put it on the government, well, we're going to be in a situation if we have a change in administration, we won't have resources to do health care reform, education reform, because we will have ballooned the balance sheet of the government for these institutions. That's my fear. Mr. E. Mark, I don't, I don't have anything substantive. substantive. Chairman Raines, and we were speaking about this before the uh, panel started, so nothing substantive to offer beyond what's been suggested already. I, I think speed right now is going to be the key, the urgency of urging Congress, the administration to figure this out soon and, and move quickly to a resolution so we can begin to, to rebuild communities. Let me ask, this is a question, and then, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take seven minutes for questions. Uh, uh, if you will, no speeches, no filibustering. This gentleman has uh, the switch for the mic. So <laughs> you can begin. Oh, Candace has the mic. He's got the switch. Uh, but here's, here's a question that's really been gnawing at me. I heard yesterday that, quote, the proposal that was revealed about a week ago had been floated 60 days ago. Don't know if that's true, but when you hear rumors <laughs> from good sources, uh, so I don't know if it's true. Secondly, we are 40 days away from a pre presidential election. And the question really is, is should this, a decision of this magnitude, this magnitude, be made with 40 days to go, a lame duck administration, uh, because we have been told that, quote, there's a catastrophe around the corner, the financial equivalent of weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> financial ammonia gas monetary mustard gas. Uh, 
you know, economic nuclear weapons sitting on the shore. Now, if in good faith we want to believe that the catastrophe is so great, the truth is if you look at the Fannie Freddie, the move on Fannie and Freddie, I've seen no article, discussion about the financial condition of those institutions. All I heard was King Henry Paulson suggest, that's what Newsweek called him, not me, <laughs> that, quote, there was an economic nuclear catastrophe in the offing. We had to make a move to shore up the markets. We're intelligent people. We can be convinced to do the right thing. But picture this scenario. Forty days before the next election, a $700 billion commitment. If I was an executive about to take over, and I knew that that kind of deal was about to be cut, I'd be hard pressed not to say you need to wait. You need to wait 40 days or you need to take a temporary step that would send a message while leaving the long-term commitment to be discussed by the future. There's a lot, and we should not be afraid to raise that issue. Given the history of decisions made in haste, decisions made with great speed. Now, I would invite anyone who is knowledgeable about the details, <laughs> knowledgeable about the specifics, uh, to come here and explain to us, to brief us not on what you suggest the fix is, but tell me what the underlying problems are. I do not want to find out, and we do not want to find out, in February, March, April, or May, that the financial mustard gas, that the economic nuclear weapons, that the uh, financial ammonia gas and the financial weapons of mass destruction were a mirage, or that they were overstated, or they were exaggerated. Folks, this is a real question that faces this nation at this time. And I hope that our leaders have the courage to ask the tough questions. I hope that our friends in the fourth estate, in the media, will stand up and ask the tough questions. I hope that experts will, as someone suggested to me this morning, float alternative plans to use ingenuity. Is there a way, for example, to look at what Mr. Raines has suggested? Is there a way to give direct assistance to homeowners to allow the loans to now perform and thereby taking non-performing assets and shoring them up. Are there alternatives? And we have to ask those questions, and we have to encourage, suggest that our leaders ask those questions. We do not want to be tricked. We do not want to be deceived. The nation's got an unemployment and jobs crisis. The nation has a health crisis. The nation has record deficits, rising unemployment, nine and a half million people who are unemployed, a number of underlying problems that also have to be addressed in addition to, quote, a rescue plan for Wall Street. So I, I frame that as a question, and I'd like to ask our panelists to bear with us for about five to six minutes, and we're going to go over here to the first question over here on my right. Barbara Birkins from Los Angeles. Thank you. Your Thank question, you. Your Thank qu you. Question quickly. I'm going to try quickly. I know the conversation was focused around financial literacy, and I'd like to think that I'm informed and I've spent a lot of years, my family, growing our wealth. We are caught up in a jumbo loan situation where um, we're not uneducated investors. We were encouraged by advisors not shark brokers, but advisors, that it was okay 
to invest a lifelong uh, earning into a particular real estate. We are now holding on by a thread in a large loan and counseling for people in this, in my income bracket, if you will, or in this type of loan is not available. And to reset, if I wait another year and a half or so to reset for, for, from this loan, we may not be able to make it. But we're using investment that we've grown over 20 years to, to hold on to all, uh, several properties for our family and my children. And so where do you go in that case? I mean, I know affordable housing, all of that, but there's other people like me who have worked, uh, you know, for 20 years. Let me go sure. to Mr. Raines. Uh, the best thing for you to do is go directly to that lender and make them Absolutely. a proposition Absolutely. that says this is what we can do. Otherwise, we're giving it back to you. Absolutely. Don't, you don't need to go direct to counseling. You need to do this as a business transaction. We believe it's in your interest to adjust this mortgage in this way. I think that's going to be the, your best solution to... To, uh, to give it back to them means giving back the equity, correct? That means giving them the whole thing back. And they, trust me, they don't want it. As, so it so you the, have some leverage. Never believe you don't have leverage in a business deal. Never believe that. There's always leverage there somewhere. The best thing for you to do is to say, I don't want it so badly I'm going to give up my entire future, but I'm willing to keep it on these terms. Have that conversation with them. In this climate, I think you've got some leverage. Good. Thank you for the response. Next question. Thank you, Mr. Raines, and thanks we, for the question. We have Emily Noner, bred for the World, Washington, D.C. Emily, yes, your question. Hello. Thank you. Um, I'm an anti-hunger advocate, and we have produced for over 35 years, we've been doing work uh, nationally in D.C., and thank you for talking about the culture of debt. And we need to start spending our, not spending our way out of poverty, but saving our way out of poverty. And I've done a lot of volunteer work with the DC EITC campaign and the DC saves. And part of that was at the library and there's volunteer income tax assistance. Anyone who makes under $28,000, single $30,000 as a couple qualifies for free tax assistance. And I wanted to know that money goes back to poor people and the people that have been most hurt by this crisis. I was hoping that you guys could address how we as communities can save from the tax season and talk about that and talk about nonprofits as tax vehicle or as saving vehicles. Uh, Ms. Tisdale, you want to respond and then Mr. Wade? Sure. Um, well, I'm hearing a lot about you're talking about how we can empower our communities and um, things like the earned income tax credit. We're going back to things, again, you know, financial education. So how many people have I, you know, spoken to who don't know that they qualify for something like the earned income tax credit? They mistake it for the child tax credit. If, you know, you own, earn as a couple $40,000 a year, you can qual and you have one or two or more qualifying children, you're talking about getting, you know, as much as $4,000 back. There are the programs and the systems in place out there, but again, it's going back to partnering with the nonprofits in your community and the, the leadership is out there. We've heard everyone talk about there is more emphasis on those types of programs in your community. It's just being more targeted in your efforts to work with some of the counseling and some of the initiatives that are out there to make your members aware of what's available to them, case in point, the earned income tax credit. Before I go to Mr. Wade, let's recognize the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee from the great state of Texas City of Houston. Join us. And let us also recognize from the same state and the same city the Honorable Al Green, Congressman. Uh, and Mr. Wade. Well, the only thing I would add quickly is that there are a number of community based organizations, I know Urban League and others, are, are helping consumers with individual development accounts. That's kind of a new concept that you help match the savings uh, of people that you're working with as an incentive to help people save. Uh, I, I don't think there's any question uh, if we're going to help break the cycle of poverty, it's about helping people accumulate assets, whether that's homes, businesses, and the like. And we've got to do all kinds of creative things uh, to make that happen. Thank you. Let's go real quickly. We'll give you 20 seconds for the question and 45 seconds for the response. <laughs> yes, uh, sir. Next, so Carla we can get Douglas, everyone in. Carla Douglas, Douglas Group, Washington, D.C. Uh, 20 thank, seconds. 20 seconds. My question in 20 seconds would be that 
um, there's a lot of talk about a moratorium on foreclosures, but I'm, a, I'm of the belief that if you have a moratorium on something and then there's no education to support during that time, when the moratorium is lifted, you're back to the same issue. So what would be the solution for education to people during that moratorium if there was one that went into effect? Uh, Mr. E. Sure. It's what Four Mark said seconds. earlier. Pick up the phone. Call your housing counselor. Call your bank. Call the nonprofit. Pick up the phone and ask. To Mr. Raines' Chairman Raines' issue earlier, every bank loses 30 to 60 percent on any home that goes into foreclosure. We don't want the homes back. We want to help you figure out your situation. So the message is pick up the phone, seek the counseling. There are tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars in resources out there today. And somebody is waiting for your call right now to help work through whatever the issue is. I guess my point would be that you know, you're putting it, then you're putting it back on the homeowner to make the call. What are your, what are your organizations doing for outreach sure, to the homeowners sure. who are not going yeah. to call? Well, one thing is to be here in discussions like we have today. So one, to be accessible and in communities. Two, we are constantly reaching out by mail, by phone. If we can reach a borrower, and I think Ken Wade this, made this uh, uh, point earlier, we resolve four out of five situations. It's only when we cannot reach the borrower. Uh, brother from so FDIC, we need to, we need to so have. So we are reaching out. It's when we don't hear back that we run into a problem. Very quickly, Mr. Wade, then I'm going to go to Congressman Jackson. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we're doing, uh, we're supporting the uh, toll-free number, 188-995-HOPE. It's a national number. You can call, get connected either to a counselor on the line, on the phone, or a local counselor in the community that you're in. Uh, there's no question we need to do more outreach, more targeted outreach, uh, to reach consumers better. The whole notion of a moratorium is not that far-fetched. After Katrina and Rita, the banks voluntarily right. agreed to a moratorium on foreclosures in the Gulf. This is not something that's all that far-fetched. It was done recently uh, for the Gulf. It would seem to me in the midst of this crisis, it's the kind of thing that we ought to be looking at. Great. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman. Thank you very much. Am I on? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Got you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We are celebrating all of you, and I would celebrate mortgage foreclosures. Uh, I'm going to be standing for mortgage foreclosure, excuse me, mortgage foreclosure moratorium. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see if you're awake. Um, uh, as much as I can. Uh, and this is something that uh, the majority in the uh, Democratic Caucus or the majority in the United States Congress advocates for because we believe that many people have been, uh, if you will, victims of uh, the process that we have unfortunately uh, created. And therefore, a moratorium is something that we should celebrate and utilize, uh, but we should do it effectively, efficiently, and rightly. But when we talk about education, I want it to be a two-way street. I want the education to come by way of the consumer. But as you well know, right now as you speak, uh, we are huddled together discussing this major $700 billion bailout. And part of the infrastructure of that bailout <coughs> is the whole question of mortgages and the uh, relevance of those mortgages and the collapse of those mortgages to where we are today. Mortgages did not become the mom-and-pop mortgage that your parents had where you moved from the housing development and the projects into your first home, you paid for it, and then you moved up, and maybe when you went off to college, there was a different kind of home. Maybe when you went off to college, you were in the same home, but they were paying for it. In this instance, they became products. Those products began to sell across the world, and when they did not pay, they started calling them in, and you had the collapse. So what do I mean by a two-way street? Educate uh, those consumers who are securing loans. But I can tell you, my friends, we're going to have to educate, re-educate the financial markets. We're going to have to rid ourselves of the abusers of the financial markets, the fraudulent persons in the financial markets. We're going to have to educate them how to deal with consumers of different economic levels, but not take advantage of consumers of different ec uh, economic levels. So let's not um, put all of the weight, and I don't suggest the question was doing that. It's a fair question on educating consumers. Consumers took advantage of the products that were put on the table.